elixir of life from physics of water bonding to upcoming technology for water treatment organized by department of physics hubli women's college hubli west bengal india in collaboration with internal quality assurance shell of hubli women's college it is a matter of immense pleasure to present this webinar on behalf of department of physics and internal quality assurance shell hubli women's college thanks to all those who have taken their time out to join this webinar students faculty members research scholars about 100 participants who have registered so far i am also thankful to our esteemed speakers dr shantanu koron of csir central salt and marine chemical research institute bhavnagar gujarat india dr obhiji chakraborty associate professor the university of bardwan bardwan west bengal india and dr shakti kundu of techie on israel institute of technology haifa israel many many thanks to them for sparing their valuable time and for agreeing to share their knowledge and finding with us soon we will start our technical session which is divided in two parts in morning session we have lectures from dr shantanu koron and dr obhijit chakraborty and at afternoon session which will start at 6 pm dr samapti kundu will deliver her lecture but before going into our technical session i will request dr shamalina goshami who is uh, the chief advisor of this webinar and coordinator iqc shell hubli women's college to welcome you all with her welcome address dr goshami please thank you thank you punor boshu good morning everybody welcome all on behalf of my college to today's international webinar water the elixir of life from physics of water bonding to upcoming technology for water treatment hosted by the department of physics in collaboration with internal assurance cell of hugli women's college in such an august virtual gathering it's a pleasure to have with us most eminent and esteemed personalities from different institutions of india and abroad it's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to you all your presence makes us very happy what it is the basis of all life on earth its structure is simple yet its behavior is a unique among liquids scientists still do not fully understand the origins of its distinctive properties water is the universal means of transport water carries all vital substances through nature it supplies the entire biosphere with nutrients and washes out pollutants likewise it flows through body organs microorganisms and all living cells the fact that the substance of the human body consists of 60 to 70% water can be interpreted as one of the many indicators of the miraculous order of creation h2o so familiar is the chemical formula for this every everyday substance the water molecule shows a distinct geometrical form water has an independent existence if it is allowed to flow freely it oozes out of the ground here and there forms straight of streams and rivers over a long periods of time again it follows own rules it is not the straight channel that suits water best but the meandering river bed formed according to the geological conditions we all know water is crucial for life we trash it anyway it is the essence of all life on earth we are facing a very serious problem of water pollution 
some 80% of the world's wastewater is dumped largely untreated back into the environment, polluting rivers, lakes, and oceans. This widespread problem of water pollution is jeopardizing, jeopardizing our health. Unsafe water kills more people each year than war and all other forms of violence combined. Water treatment is necessary to improve the quality of water, to make it appropriate for a specific end use like drinking, like industrial water supply, irrigation, etc. etc. Water absorbs information from its environment in a phenomenal fashion, stores it, passes it on. None of these is imaginable without the exchange of energy. Where water obtains the energy for its vitalizing forces, for its continuous communication with the world with which it is in contact cannot be explained by conventional physics. Disciplines like quantum physics and the latest analysis and measuring methods promise some enlightenment. Any topic has a beginning and an end, but in the science of water, no one has the last word that is end. I would like to convey my greetings to Dr. Shantanu Karan and Dr. Obhiji Chakraborty, the distinguished speakers of the first technical session of today's webinar for taking time out and being here today. Once again, I welcome all the faculty, scholars, and students for their participation in such a contemporary and thought-provoking issue. Now, I would like to uh, over to our beloved principal, Dr. Shima Banerjee, for her inaugural speech. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shambhulina. Good evening, everybody. This is a video I'm going to extend my wishes on behalf of the Department of Physics of Hubli Women's College, West Bengal, India. And the IPC, all participants, the invited eminent speakers, who are the main wild attraction to me. The important topic is what are the exterior of life? From last month, 19, uh, sorry, 2019, we are seeing through an arms forcing crisis, social distancing, long new normal are the new concepts incorporated in our daily life all over the world. In spite of all the odds, we are assembled today here in this web platform to enrich ourselves. I extend my heartiest thanks to all the invited speakers who have agreed to share to share their knowledge in this webinar. I also ex extend my heart heartfelt thanks to all the participants for registering themselves in this webinar to make it a great success. And last but not least, I must mention that in these trying times, our civic department. has organized an international webinar on such a contemporary issue. I appreciate their endeavor from the deepest corner of my heart. Water, as you know, is the main constituent of our body weight. It is of major importance to all living beings. The esteemed speakers will focus today on the structure and bonding of water as well as the advanced technique of water purification. Only pure water consumption can give us a long Thank you, Principal Madam, uh, for your heartwarming uh, uh, inaugural speech. And uh, thanks to Dr. Goswami also. 
uh, with this uh, our uh, tech uh, our uh, inaugural session is over and now we will uh, going to our technical session uh, in our uh, morning session we have with us uh, dr obiji chakraborty from badon university and dr shantanu koron from csir central salt and marine chemical research institute bhavnagar gujarat uh, in this session dr shantanu will deliver his lecture first and thereafter dr obiji chakraborty will deliver his talk uh, for a uh, brief introduction of dr shantanu koron uh, he is a senior scientist and dst ramanujam fellow at csir central salt and marine chemicals research institute bhavnagar gujarat india he has done his phd from indian association for cultivation of sciences kolkata india and he has done his postdoctoral research at national institute for material science sukuba japan he was postdoctoral research associate at imperial college london uk his research area consists of interfacial phenomena polymer physics microporous and mesoporous materials transpose properties his publication includes 35 research publications in different national and international peer reviewed journals and he got five international patent in his credit topic of his lectures is polymer nanofilms membranes with ultra fast liquid transfer transport used for molecular separation i request dr koron to start his presentation uh good morning to all thank you very much uh, for having me on this platform and i'm very excited to introduce my uh, small research group uh, from uh, csm cri bhavnagar uh, i have been working here for uh, uh, roughly last 3 years uh, so today uh, i'm uh, very much thankful to uh, to uh, to the principal madam and uh, punar vasu sir uh, samalina madam and also uh, chirantan uh, chirantan could you please uh, show the ppt slide yes uh, i'm 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 very sorry that uh, my laptop was not working for some reason and uh, uh, hopefully you all are uh, uh, listening me properly am i audible to all can anyone confirm that i am audible yes it is very clear you are clearly okay, audible right. okay thank you thank you so uh, i'm going to present the, the the recent research work the summary of my uh, you know like uh, the group research what i am currently doing here in csmc right uh, i am going to explain on polymer nanofilm membranes uh, with ultra fast uh, liquid transport uh, which is used for molecular separation so what we do exactly uh, is uh, is basically making a thin film membrane and uh, and uh, use them for for molecular separation so uh, before i uh, go for uh, molecular separation with membranes uh, i would like to introduce because uh, maybe this this field of research is not uh, familiar to all so just to explain uh, in a in a you know in a uh, very uh, brief way what are the membranes like uh, as you can see on the left side chirantan second slide please Yes, I can see, but it's only only the first slide. Okay, go for the next one. Yeah. 
So if you can see on your left uh, that uh, there are uh, four different kind of membranes. Like uh, if I start from uh, from the lower bottom, like microfiltration, and then UF is ultrafiltration, NF is nanofiltration, and RO is reverse osmosis. So these four kind of uh, membranes uh, they have different kind of pore size. Uh, like for microfiltration membrane is uh, about 100 nanometer pore size, uh, two up to a micron uh, pore size. And then it starts, uh, if it is smaller than one micron, it goes, uh, sorry, if it is smaller than 100 nanometer, we call it say ultrafiltration membrane. It is usually from 10 to 100 nanometer pore size. So this membrane, so which we are making here, they have definite porous structure to, to a certain size, like uh, uh, nanofiltration is one to 10 nanometer and reverse osmosis is less than a nanometer. So depending on, on the membrane of, of our need to purify something, we have to apply the pressure to get a reasonable uh, permeance through the thin film. That means a, a membrane which you can apply pressure to, to get some liquid flow through the membrane. So this will help you to purify something. If you have, let's say, water and sodium chloride, just as an example for reverse osmosis membrane, if you have sodium chloride in water, you use this uh, reverse osmosis membrane, you apply pressure, so the salt will get rejected through the separation layer of the membrane. However, the water will flow uh, through the membrane, so you will get a pure water through the membrane. Differently, you, you, depending on the size of the membrane, you can separate like a bacteria, fat, algae, colloids. These are the bigger size. So, so the microfiltration micro membrane will be useful there. And if you need to uh, separate salt or mineral, then you need the smallest pore size membrane like reverse osmosis membrane. Next, please. So the application of, of these uh, membranes, uh, they have huge applications starting from the electronic industry, pharmaceutical application, medical application, uh, fine and bulk chemistry, oil and petrochemical industry, and environment remediation. So I will cover all this, uh, uh, you know, the application area. Uh, let me introduce why we need this traditional, other than traditional distillation method, why you need this membrane. So the membranes is basically useful because the separation process in the industry that needs 40 to 70% of the energy for the operation cost. So the purification cost is a, is a major, uh, you know, a major troublesome to get the purified product in the industry. So to do that one, sorry, Chirantan, uh, can you go for the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So if you consider why we need a, a membrane, so if I compare with the traditional distillation, Consider one meter cube of uh, dilute solution of any, any solvent. So you have something in a, in a huge volume of, uh, of uh, solvent. And then if you want to concentrate it, let's say you, you have in methanol and you want to concentrate it at 10 times. So what you have to do, you have to evaporate the methanol and then it concentrate uh, product will come. And obviously the methanol will, you have to cool it down to get pure methanol. So in that case, you can actually get a concentrated product from a dilute solution just by applying heat and doing the normal distillation method. So in that case, you need a evaporation energy, which is about 865 megajoule for one meter cube of a dilute solution of methanol. That, that value will change depending on what solvent you use. And to concent concentrate, uh, to condense it, it will also need 865 megajoule of cooling energy. So in total, if you need to do the, uh, you know, the separation with uh, normal distillation method, you need more than 1700 uh, megajoule of energy. But if you use a membrane, and if you apply it under some pressure, let's say 30 bar, and you do at ambient temperature, so that means you need to, you don't need to apply any heat to do the separation. Rather, you will just use a pump energy to pressurize the liquid and get the separation through the membrane. You get the pure uh, solvent through the membrane and the product will get concentrated. So this, in this case, you need only six megajoule energy, and which is uh, actually much, much lower than comparatively a uh, traditional distillation method. So these uh, membrane processes are basically greener and cheaper alternative to the traditional method. Now processing with organic liquids, if you see on this left side, I think some of uh, you will be familiar that these are uh, basically the modules or the plant housing of a reverse osmosis plant. This reverse osmosis plant is, is in Israel and is the world largest capacity plant and ever built. So it can produce 320,000 uh, meter cube per day. And now on the right, if you see, this is a oil refinery, which is in, in Gujarat, near to our place, is in Jamnagar. 
but they still use a traditional uh, you know fractional distillation to purify uh, fossil fuel so now if we can actually replace all this uh, distillation column with membranes so we can save a lot of energy however to make them you have to make sure that the solvent stable membranes are available so you have to produce solvent stable membrane to apply for uh, oil refinery industry so our hope to to make solvent stable membranes to apply actually both in in reverse osmosis and in oil refinery industry so now how how they looks like this uh, membranes what we work here is on thin film composite membrane thin film composite membrane is basically from the name you can understand is a thin film and is a composite structure so you have a composite structure three layer structure if you see on your left top left this cartoon is indicating you that the lower part which is written is a non oven support and then you have a ultra filtration membrane on top of that and the finally is a microporous skin layer so this microporous is basically thin layer is basically the separation layer which is actually doing the the job for the separation and on, on the right corner you can see that uh, this is a uh, acm image so where the fabric is in the lower part and in between you have a uh, uh, support membrane which is called uh, ultra filtration support and a very thin tfc or thin film composite layer is on the top it's made out of polyamide layer so to do this one to make a thin film composite membrane you basically need a three layer structure which will give the lower support will give you the strength of the membrane and the in between the, the second layer will give you the support for the top layer because the top layer is very thin so you have to have a support to hold the top layer so to to get uh, this thin film structure we have to keep in mind that it has to be uh, like high mechanical stability it has to be there because it need to work under high pressure and the, the top layer should not have any defect and it will also have the solvent stability and it will have to have like a industrial scalability uh, to make them scalable for industrial application now the hypothesis hypothesis of this research is how thick or thin the top layer the separation layer will be so if you if you can consider this a small equation called a hagen poiseuille equation uh, the flux j is a, is basically the solvent or liquid flux is inversely proportional to the thickness l so l is basically the length of the channel here the thickness of the thin film at the top layer of the separation layer so if you see on in the cartoon that the spongy structure on your left it will give you a very small flux means thickness l is higher here so it will produce a smaller j value but if you can decrease the thickness of this uh, separation layer something like in the right side of the of the uh, cartoon you can eventually understand that the thickness thickness is decreasing that means j will be inversely proportional so it will be much higher so the higher flux it will be only available when you can make a very thin film so that's why we are interested to make thin film composite membrane so this thin film will give you higher flux compared to the thick one this thinner is basically faster and low solute loss that means if you have a spongy stru structure sorry that will absorb the, the the product you are going to separate so better to have a very smooth and very thin film now i will give you four example uh, four or five example like uh, one is example one is solvent stable carbon nanosheet so here we we made a porous carbon nanofilm layer or a nanosheet layer on top of a alumina support so the alumina support which is showing here on the on the left of the cartoon is a basically a big pore size support having 200 nanometer pore and on top of that we want to make a very thin film to get the proper separation and the top layer will have some definite pore structure so from that pores uh, the separation will happen now on a, on a very big pore structure on a very big pore structure how how you will make a very thin film because if you make by there are many conventional uh, polymerization technique like interfacial polymerization plasma polymerization spin coating deep coating all of four will not help much because the material will go inside the pore so you need to have a top and very thin smooth layer uh, so that we can have a higher flux so if it introduce if it got inside the pore structure so that eventually it will form a very thick film so that thick film will eventually give you lower flux so our interest to make a very thin film on top of the pore structure to do that one we introduce a nano strand layer something like a rice straw in a village hut so it can actually cover the big pores and on top of that uh, nano strand layer 
we can make our thin film. So the lower ACM image you can see, we have uh, made a very thin nano strand layer on alumina support. So the pores of the supports are clearly visible. And on top of that, we can cover the pores with the nano strand layer. Now these nano strands are basically cadmium hydroxide nano strand. These are metal nano, metal hydroxide nano strand. I, I just keep this one because it's uh, not much relevant to the story. But how to make them? That's what I, I uh, put the structure here. So in the lower part, if you see that the, you you got the support, and then we made a nano strand layer on top of that, and then on top of that we made a plasma enhanced carbon. Uh, sorry, plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition to make a thin carbon layer. And finally, if we can remove the uh, nanostand layer, we can have a freestanding uh, uh, nanostate layer directly on the top of the support. So what we have done, we took a support which has a bigger pore. We made a nanostand layer to protect uh, the, or to, to reduce the pore size. And then on top of the nanostand, we made a carbon layer and finally, after the carbon layer deposition, we removed the nano strand layer to get a freestanding film directly deposited on the alumina support. This can be done with plus minus carbon uh, chemical vapor deposition. And if you see the ACM image here, uh, this carbon nano sheet. So the next, yeah. So the nano strand, if you see that the top left corner is a is a very thin nano strand layer, and then you deposit a nano sheet on on top of the nano strand and you remove the nano strand to get a nano sheet. Finally, what we have uh, got from the nanofilm membrane, uh, we got a separation through this uh, nanofilm layer or nano sheet, carbon nano sheet layer. Uh, we tried to, mini, uh, to characterize their pore size just by passing three different molecules, azobenzene, fluorescein for isothiocyanate, and protoporphyrin-9. These three molecules have three different uh, molecular size, so depending on the on their molecular size, the, the membrane will give a rejection. So if you see the bird rules here in the inset of the picture, like the feed means the, the, the liquid which we want to basically purify and the filtrate means which is going through the membrane and we are getting the clear or, or the purified product or only the solvent. So in case of azobenzene, you can still see some color in the filtrate side. That means some molecules is going through the membrane. So that means it does not have a perfect rejection. That's why the rejection is 94% that we characterize. But if you increase the size to certain extent, like a fluorescein 4 isothiocyanate, you can see almost 99.6, that means the almost complete rejection uh, we can achieve. That means the pore size is smaller than the size of the fluorescein 4 isothiocyanate. Eventually, if we get, uh, if we took a bit bigger, like a protoporphyrin 9, we can get 100% rejection. In this case, you can see the filtrate is transparent so that there is no protoporphyrin molecule coming through the membrane so in that uh, you know like the, the 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 rejection property of the membrane we can calculate like the pore size is 0 0.7 to 1 nanometer with the porosity porosity means the number of pores on the surface of the membrane is about 12 percent now what the interesting part about this one these nanofilm membranes okay they they are porous we can pass some solvent through it we can reject some molecule uh, using this membrane. But most interesting part is, is this, this graph. Like if you see the flux versus viscosity, so depending on the Poisson-Lewis equation, if you can consider like is inversely proportional to the viscosity of a solvent. So I think it's, it's very interesting here that your isopropanol or propanol or butanol, which has higher viscosity, is showing a very little flux compared to hexane, which is actually giving the highest flux here. So from this phenomena, we, we, we uh, kind of uh, you know, established for the first time that a very small pore, less than a nanometer, is actually behaving uh, a viscosity dependent relationship of the permeability. So the solvent can go uh, like a, you know, uh, liquid and the flux of this liquid, that means the, how fast the solvent is going through the membrane is basically 100 to 1000 times faster than the commercial membrane. So in a not cell, what we have made, we have made a carbon thin film, which are porous and which has a definite pore size of less than one nanometer. And also it allows the viscosity dependent solvent flow through the, through, through the membrane and is 100 to 1000 times faster than the commercial membrane. So it gave us, So it gave us uh, like, uh, you know, the, finally we managed to publish in science uh, 
uh, where the, the title you can see here. The interesting part was here, like it, it gave us ultra first viscous permeation. So this ultra first permeation is much beneficial to process some liquid with much lower energy compared to the conventional membranes because it is faster than the conventional membrane. Next example is, so the next thought came, like if we can make a carbon thin film with a pore size less than one nanometer, can we make it from a polymer which has intrinsic microporosity? That means we choose a polymer, the polymer itself has the microporous structure. If we make a thin film, that microporous structure will be useful to make a membrane and use that microporous structure to get the separation out of that membrane. So to do that one, we started with PIM. It's called PIM polymer with intrinsic microporosity. And with this, we started making a thin film. So we spin coated on a, on a glass slide. And then the thin film was transferred on a porous support. And finally, we get a membrane uh, out of this, uh, you know, the polymer. And made a membrane uh, as a thin porous support. So to, to make a membrane, I mean, the polymer thin film, you have to have a porous support. So you can do the thin film and the liquid will go through the thin film and through the support membrane, and you will get the, uh, you know, the like solvent going through the membrane with some rejection property. So what do you observe here? This thin film, next please. Yeah, so this thin film, if you see the left side of this, uh, this graph, like we are plotting here permeance with the thickness of the membrane. So if we decrease the thickness of the membrane, we can actually increase the, with decreasing thickness, we are getting increased or higher flux or higher permeance. So with a value of about 140 nanometer thick, we are getting the highest flux. Next slide, please. Yes. So with a 140 nanometer thickness, we are getting the highest flux. And with further decreasing the, th decreasing the thickness, we are actually getting reduced permeance. So that one was like some anomalous behavior here. So we are about to get, according to the Poisoli's uh, formula, that the thinner is much per more permeable than the thicker one. But in this case, if we go below 140 nanometer, that theory, uh, like the Poisoli's equation was not valid here. So we found some anomalous behavior below 140 nanometer thickness, where the flux was not inversely proportional to the thickness. So wh why it happens is basically your polymer thin film is aging under pressure. So that very thin film of 85 nanometer or 35 nanometer thick is not working because the pore size where, where we started with that intrinsic microporous structures are not available here. So the film is behaving like a very dense film and your permeance is, is decreasing. So the Poisoli's equation is not exactly uh, followed here. So on the right, if you see the graph, uh, yeah, on the right, if you see the graph, this membrane, this, this green line, I'm plotting here the thickness versus permeability. Permeability means the liquid permeance multiplied by its thickness. So to a certain extent, this permeability remains constant. And if you decrease the thickness, the permeance, uh, sorry, permeability goes down, which is again the same thing what I just explained that uh, your permeability of the material is not constant. That means below a certain thickness, the materials is getting uh, a different porous structure or the porous structure is losing. However, we get 90 times higher permeance compared to the commercial star M240. And uh, uh, this one was still uh, like, uh, you know, higher than the commercial star M membrane. So in a nutshell, the intrinsic microporosity was only accessible to the solvent permeation for a thin film of uh, more than 150 nanometer thickness. So that means lower than 150 nanometer thick, the intrinsic microporous structure was not accessible for membrane separation. And the faster aging of the polymer with losing intrinsic microporous structure uh, was, was noticed when the film gets thinner. Linear PMs are unstable. So the, the polymer, what we used in this study was a linear polymer. Uh, so it was, it was soluble in polar solvent. So this particular membrane, membrane in that case is not practically uh, you know, useful for, for separation of polar solvent. Uh, however, we can do the cross-linking, but the cross-linking will again reduce the solvent permeance. So finally, the drawbacks from this study was uh, a linear polymer membrane is not useful for organic solvent separation. The third example is a, again, network cross-linked polymer, but we started making them uh, 
you know, from interfacial polymerization. Interfacial polymerization is a kind of polymerization technique. The polymerization happens at the interface between two liquids. One is, uh, in our case, is water, and another one is hexane. So we put metaphenyl diamine, like on the left, and trimethyl chloride in two different phases, and then make the interfacial polymerization at water and hexane interface to get a cross-linked polyamide structure. So the idea was to make a polymer thin film uh, via interfacial polymerization. And we managed to get a sub 10 nanometer polyamide nanofilm. Uh, if you see this, the, this cartoon, we took a support membrane and we impregnate this uh, metaphenyl diamine in the support membrane. We took a nano strand layer to get a reservoir, reservoir of the amine compound. And then we make an interfacial polymerization on top of the nano strand layer to get a polyamide layer uh, from metaphenyl diamine and trimethyl chloride. So if you see the chemical structure here, we can happily make them a very thin cross-linked, highly network cross-linked structure of polyamide. And after removing the nanostrand layer, you can get a very thin eight nanometer thick polyamide nanofilm. So uh, this cartoon, and I think there is a molecular dynamic simulation on the right, uh, on the top corner, but uh, this movie will not work, I guess. Uh, so if I go to the next slide here, <coughs> this degree of network cross-linking, this degree of network cross-linking is basically, if you took a metaphenyl diamine and trimethyl chloride, depending on the ratio of their concentration, you can have two different kinds of cross-linking structure. One is fully network cross-linked, that means the top part, and the lower part you have two, partially cross-linked and partially linear cross-linked. So depending on your, you know, the, the interfacial polymerization kinetics, you can make them highly cross-linked or less cross-linked structure. And depending on that one, you will get a different water permeance or solvent permeance through the thin film. So using this method, <clears throat> using this method, we can actually make polyamide nanofilm of two different structures, like a physical structure. One is smooth polyamide nanofilm on the left, and on the right is shown like a polyamide structure with a crumpled nanofilm. So depending on the smoothness or crumpledness, we can actually have a different surface area of the film. Obviously, on the right, that crumpled nanofilm will give you a higher permeable area because it can access much more area compared to a smooth area, smooth film. So the smooth film will have only, you know, the proportional to the, to the support. But however, crumpled nanofilm will give you much higher area uh, than the support where it is, is, uh, is made on the support, for a support. This crumpled nanofilm structure from the TEM image, you can see, they, they, they have the nodular structure. So the increasing surface area is quite visible here. And also the cross-section image, you see, they, they are like a bubble-like. So this hollow bubble structure will, will add uh, interfacial area. That means the permeable area of the membrane. Next, please. Next, yeah. Uh, so then, then we started uh, measuring the thickness of uh, this sub-10 nanometer polyamide nanofilm. Uh, from AFM. Uh, Chirantan, please, uh, the previous slide. Yes, thank you. So this sub-10 nanometer polyamide nanofilm is, is very difficult to measure the thickness from this, uh, you know, ACM image. So we took them on a silicon wafer and we scratch uh, on the left side, you can see, we scratch them to remove the polyamide. And under AFM, we started making, uh, measuring the thickness uh, from left to right. If you go from left to right, that means you are touching on the silicon wafer, and then on the right, you will get a step profile to get the thickness of the polymer thin film. So on the right side of the graph, you can see like the height versus distance. So if I travel from the left to right, uh, you will see the silicon wafer and a step profile, which is basically the thickness of the membrane is about 8.4 nanometer. And this one was the thinnest polymer membrane uh, I mean, uh, in 2015, it was published. That time, it was the thinnest polymer membrane uh, made by interfacial polymerase. So this sub-10 nanometer polyamide film are also impressively strong. So with a Young's modulus value of 2.7 gigapascal, although it looks very thin, but is equally strong, uh, like 2.7 gigapascal. The way we measured the mechanical property of this thin film is, is basically a wrinkling experiment. So what we have done, we took a PDMS rubber, we stretch the rubber, and we transfer the nanofilm on top of the stretched rubber. And once you, you release the rubber, that means you are actually compre compressing the thin film. So you are applying a compressive stress, 
across the across the length of the thin film and then that that that, that thin film will actually follow a sinusoidal wire that's the called the wrinkling so the compressive force will allow the film to wrinkle uh, something like uh, in the afm image you can see on the right side so from this wrinkling uh, wavelength you can actually measure the young's modulus value of the thin film so we have first time we have introduced this kind of technique how the very thin film uh, you know like uh, just by forming the wrinkle you can measure the uh, bulk value of the young's modulus of the nano film then uh, we measured the chemical property of the polyamide nanofilm so from the xps uh, x ray photoelectron spectroscopy you can see the the consequent uh, elements are uh, carbon nitrogen and oxygen so for very thin film you can see the gold peak here au4f5 by 2 and in the lower part you can see that the film is uh, crumpled so the i am comparing here the smooth versus crumpled so for crumpled film you will eventually not see the gold because the effective thickness of the crumpled film is much thicker here so from xps study you can actually understand if you see the gold of the underneath support you can understand okay this is very thin film and if you don't see that means a thick film was formed so for molecular separation what we have done we use the very very similar technique like i discussed from the uh, for the uh, previous example we took a uh, dye molecule here acid fusin so we apply pressure uh, with a feed containing acid fusin molecules and we collected the permeate here we do see the permeates has no acid fusin molecule coming through to the membrane that means the membrane has a pore size which is smaller than the size of the acid fusin so using this uh, polyamide membrane we can actually separate uh, a model molecule like acid fusin uh, very fast because the 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 solvent permeance was 110 lmh bar and compared to the uh, commercial membrane is uh, more than two orders of magnitude higher so the solvent permeance on the right if you see that it follows three parameter dependency not like in the previous case like in carbon uh, nano sheet it was only solvent was uh, permeable uh, depending on its uh, viscosity however in this case we found it also depends on the polarity of the solvent obviously it also depend on the viscosity and the molecular diameter of of the of the molecule so in a in a collective way if we plot this uh, the parameter solvent parameter with the permeance of the solvent we get uh, a straight line behavior so if we can fit across uh, with this uh, sorry with this uh, model equation we can actually uh, calculate the solvent permeance of any unknown solvents uh, from this to straight line behavior now if we use dmf and we apply on the top of the membrane we can see that the after active is called activation after solvent activation we can increase the flux the red graph here red uh, data point uh, on the top so we can get a 35 liter per hour per meter square per bar uh, compared to a, a value of about 5 liter per hour per meter square per bar <clears throat> so after solvent activation we can actually enhance the uh, so we can we can make a different uh, chemical structure different density of the thin film uh, after activation so depending on the activation we can make a varieties of polymer nanofilm with a different uh, separation property now again if you see a permeance on the left you can see like a, the permeance of the smooth film the black uh, curve here on the bottom is uh, much lower compared to a crumpled nano film because as i said the crumpled structure will have much higher permeable area compared to the smooth film and uh, the two afm images are showing that the smooth film is uh, is basically a dark uh, background and the crumpled film which you can see on the right green uh, greenish color Uh, is clearly showing the rough crumpled structure of the nanofilm and on the on the very bottom the methanol flux under pressure was linear which indicating is uh, this thin film is uh, highly stable under high pressure application so even if you go under uh, uh, i mean apply uh, 50 bar across the membrane your methanol permeance permeance was linear that means depending on the amount of liquid you want to process you can choose your applied pressure to make the process faster So the overall remarks from this uh, work was uh, this network crosslink polymer nanofilm and the carbon film that I I just said in the example one, they are showing the highest permeance of solvent. Manipulating the reaction condition, we can get a different morphology like a smooth nanofilm, crumpled nanofilm, controlling the interfacial polymerization. Combination of this high 
degree of cross-linking and also although it is very thin the resilient nanofilm of less than 10 nanometer can be formed crumpled features they don't collapse under very high pressure as i just showed it's also stable up to 50 bar and where we can get increasing solvent permeance under high pressure so the crumpled structure you can actually have the advantage from that uh, the crumpled structure does not deform under high pressure this is added advantage compared to a smooth nanofilm this paper uh, was also published in science in 2015 and that time as i said it was the thinnest uh, polymer membrane made uh, via interfacial polymerization so the next uh, example is a uh, example four is also a polymer thin film uh, but we are interested here to make a bigger molecular weight cut of membrane that means this pore size of the pore size of the membrane will be much bigger where we can actually separate bigger molecules from a small molecule. So the previous examples were two separate solvent from a small molecule, but here the example is to, to make a bigger pore so that we can have the advantage of having separation between two different, molecule pore, uh, two, two different molecules. So the idea is to make a bigger pore so that uh, the, the, when you have a mixed of, uh, mixture of uh, different molecules or molecules in, in different ions, uh, like in salt, then the salt will go through the membrane. However, the, the, the bigger molecule will, will get retained. So this has a, a huge benefit in the, in the industry like, uh, you know, like textile industry where they use a dye molecule in water along with some sodium chloride or sodium sulfate. And then they, they just cook in a pressure cooker kind of uh, instrument uh, to, to put the color in the garments. But finally, they need to process the liquid uh, to separate the, the dye, remaining dyes uh, from the salt. So that they can use the water molecules also so the processed water can be used in the industry uh, to get a zero liquid discharge so to help the industry this kind of membranes uh, with zero liquid discharge is much more meaningful so here you can see we started with the self-assembly of ultra thin polyimine nanofilms that was formed by a self-assembly method uh, uh, then uh, we actually got a uh, uh, oligomer of the poly uh, this uh, polyimine nanofilm first so this oligomer will get self-assembled at the interface uh, on top of a water surface, basically. And it will form a very thin, like around 14 nanometer thin film. At this 14 nanometer thin film, as you see in the AFM, we, we, we got the similar measurement, like I, I explained in the last uh, example. Uh, from the stay height, we can measure the, the thickness of the polymer thin film. And on the right, top right, you can see the molecular area versus rejection property, that means uh, depending on the molecular size, you get the rejection. So if you want to separate sulfate or chloride ions from a molecule, let's say BBR, that means uh, brilliant blue R. So you can see the brilliant blue R has almost 100% rejection, where the sulfate or chloride ion can uh, happily go through the membrane. So we can eventually have a very nice separation between brilliant blue R and salt. So on the left bottom, you can see the rejection of many different uh, ions and small molecules. Uh, like sodium chloride, sulfate, potassium ferricyanide, methyl orange, acid fusine, azobenzene. Uh, these all kind of molecules you can see depending on their molecule or size, uh, you can have their separation. Something like in molecular, uh, sorry, methyl orange and brilliant blue R, this combination, I mean the mixture of these two molecules will also help you to get the small molecule going through the membrane, while the, the bigger molecule will retain on the top part of the membrane. So you can actually fractionate them depending on the molecular size, uh, uh, of the, the model molecules here we choose. Uh, similar like the previous case, as I said, like the permeance is dependent on the viscosity only here because the pore size is bigger and the molecules, of the, I mean the solvent molecule do not have the much interaction. So it does not depend on the polarity or other uh, uh, like uh, molecular size. It, it simply depends on the viscosity. So the viscosity, inverse of viscosity and permeance is, is linear here. We have also worked on the, on a, uh, oh, sorry, this, this work was published in Advanced Material very recently. And uh, we have also done example five here. We, we made the positively charged uh, nanofilm. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, this, this particular membrane is a positively charged uh, polyethylene nanofilm. So this, these are useful for the application where you need to remove uh, the cation from from uh, any you know like contaminated water uh, as a feed 
so if you have a, a cationic um, molecules or ions in, in the in the feed you have to have a cationic membrane so that's why we are interested to make polyethylene imine which is basically uh, cationic in nature so depending on you know the the way you make you may, you can make a different thickness and we we also introduce different nanoparticles like a gif8 porous structure and we introduce uh, iron oxide nanoparticle titanium oxide nanoparticle in the separation layer like uh, you can see from the uh, top left is a 36 nanometer thin film then uh, we can make 64 nanometer 53 nanometer 54 nanometer so depending on the reaction kinetics and the the thickness you want to control you can make them via uh, interfacial polymerization with polyimine as a precursor so we we managed to introduce uh, carbon nanotube within this polyamide uh, sorry polyimine nanofilm structure Uh, where eventually uh, we don't have that kind of you know like a definite control of making them vertical across the thin film but eventually they ended up with some of them uh, horizontally aligned uh, and some of them are vertically aligned uh, within this polyimine nanofilm this work was uh, published uh, recently is actually in press now and uh, it was published in advanced uh, materials interfaces so that one was the end of my presentation so i would like to acknowledge uh, my group members uh, mr pulok sarkar my phd student and dr sulagna modok uh, she is ra and also uh, collaborators uh, dr karishma tiwari from csm cri dr sumit pramanik from csm cri and dr amitabh das from iser kolkata and i also like to acknowledge uh, these two fellowship which i uh, i am currently having this ramanujan fellowship grant and a dst uh, granting project and also the csm cri analytical facility and thank you very much for listening my presentation thank you so i'll be happy to take uh, you know if you have any question yeah so uh, let me take over from it i thank the speaker dr santosh karan for this wonderful talk and a of course very technical talk uh, now uh, Uh, the session is open for some question answer um, i cannot see uh, many questions in the youtube which is live there but i have one question yes please hello yeah so uh, what kind of theoretical or numerical studies people are doing or you people are doing maybe or is there some kind of percolation diffusion study or in theoretical model you can suggest uh, where you can show some nano film passing water through it is there some kind of theoretical model uh, where people can do numerical studies yes uh, there are uh, th this actually this permeation theory only three theories uh, i mean the the standard theories are there one is called uh, like a hagen poiseuille equation which i just explained is uh, yes. based on the size of the membrane or is called like a convective flow and uh, the okay. other one is uh, basically diffusion flow that means uh, the uh, the solvent permeation will depend on the diffusivity of the molecule uh, this happens okay. only through the dense film when you don't have the definite porous structure but if you have a porous structure that means most uh, reliable theory is a hagen poiseuille is a convective flow theory uh, but other than that depending on the membrane you can do the uh, numerical simulation uh, based on what membrane you are measuring and you can validate uh, with the experimental results but to my knowledge there are uh, this this three uh, standard uh, equation like one i just said hagen poiseuille and one i just modified in a, in my second paper uh, that is also dependent on viscosity and the and the molecular uh, property like polarity and uh, its molecular size uh, this is basically a semi empirical formula and the other one the third one is diffusion uh, related is called solution diffusion model so this three okay. model you can based on that uh, you can design okay okay thank you yeah and i heard some kind of study where carbon nanotube uh, uh, model is shown and water is passing through it yeah and uh, is it kind of percolation study i mean uh, so percolation study uh, percolation is uh, specifically known for like you know like uh, when we do in a much bigger uh, particles so you okay. have a basically big big pores 
So I don't think this is uh, available for this nano dimension, something like in a carbon nanotube dimension or, or something like what I said, like this nanopores. Okay. Okay, thank you. But it's basically, basically the building block of this percolation, this percolation theory is the building block of all this, uh, you know, the uh, permeation theory. Okay, sir, thank you. So uh, there is no more question in the YouTube chat box. So let us thank the speaker again. And uh, over to Punar Boshu, sir. Uh, thanks to Dr. Koron and thanks to Dr. Shuman uh, for his role as a, uh, as a moderator. And we got a very informative lecture on uh, different polymer nanofilm membrane. And I think uh, our participants also get illuminated in this uh, field of research. So uh, this is the end of first session of uh, our technical session uh, today. And now we'll move on to our second lecture this morning, which will be delivered by Dr. Obhiji Chakraborty, Associate Professor at the University of Bardwan. Uh, he has passed he has uh, done his master's from Calcutta University and he has done his PhD from Jadavu University. His postdoctoral research works was at MS Laboratory, Iowa State University, USA, and University of Hawaii, USA. His field of research interests are molecular spectroscopy, ab initio calculation of structure and potential energy surface, experiments with molecular beams. He has 21 publications in international peer review journals and three publications, three research uh, uh, publications in uh, national peer review journals. He has four book chapters he, he has published and he has acted as an editor in a, one book. And now he is uh, actively guiding four PhD students. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti will illuminate us with the uh, physics of water bonding. I request Dr. Chakravarti to take on the stage. Hello, am I audible? Yes, hello. Sir. Oh, okay. Uh, at the very outset, I will uh, definitely thank uh, the authorities of Hooghly Women's College and particularly Chiranton, Shomnath, Bhai, and Punar Boshu uh, so, to allow me to say something about our work, but uh, considering the situation under which we are passing through, this is a very tough situation, uh, I thought that I should mainly focus on the students. So initially when I saw in the chat box only eight people, I'm a little bit concerned. Everyone is uh, senior and everyone is a teacher of uh, high repute. Uh, for them, it might so happen this is pretty elementary, uh, but I thought um, I should say something uh, to the students for which I am talking mainly, uh, focusing on the students. So uh, I'm trying my presentation now. Uh, a window. Uh, okay. So uh, my, I start with uh, my talk, which is the bonding of water. So, uh, first of all, whenever we study anything, our main aim is, our first question that comes to us whenever it, we are studying in the school or in university classes, whoever is teaching, that why is it so important to study this? First of all, that Professor Goswami has, IQVC coordinator Goswami has told in his, uh, in our inaugural speech, that without water, there will be no life. This is exactly the same like here. And you know that whenever we are trying to find out if there is any one, uh, any human being or any cell or any life in any other parts of the universe apart from art, uh, we always try to find out whether there is water or not. One of the reasons that presence of water will give us some hope that there will be life there. 
Another important thing, no enzymes work without water. That means whatever we are swallowing, whatever we are taking as a food or medicine or drugs, that will never work without the presence of water. So water is that way important. Importantly, a question arises to all of us that if water is the one of the main things to sustain life here, so when earth is formed, how does water came into being in this earth or in this planet? It is important that the, this came here from comets. I hope students know that there are a lot of stuff as came from comets, different comets to, uh, to earth from meteorites. And very recently one meteorite has passed by our planet on July 24th. One of this planet, one of the planets was Marchinson's one, which was found uh, in 1969, probably 69 or 70, in the Marchinson region in Australia. And that piece of material, when analyzed, interestingly, people find out amino acids as also waters there. So water came here or formed in the earth from extraterrestrial environment. Whatever we, whenever we talk of water, we have some in the background, we generally think of water is something like liquid that we drink a lot. But actually water uh, contains millions of millions of H2O molecules. So water is one form, one kind of ensemble of these H2O molecules. Uh, now the question is how this H2O molecules connect to form a water or whatever other phases. And how do you know about their connections? That means since a water that we drink or ice, other form of water or water vapor, the different states of waters, ensembles of waters, if it contains millions and millions of water, H2O molecules, then how do you know about their intermolecules? So how the inter H2O molecules interact with one another to form these different kinds of uh, water species as also I have I have not written in the uh, in the presentation, but the water that we have we, we observe it from extraterrestrial environment, which is not exactly the same in terms of structure to the ones that you observe here. So that's also important, but it but it is a little bit technical. So I might not have time to go that extent to explain that. And another important thing that uh, in the second point, you will see that one of the examples are no water, no enzymes work without water. That means water, all the drugs and all the different stuff that we eat or swallow, whatever maybe that needs water. So water needs to attach to these molecules. So this is also important, the attachment of water with itself and attachment of waters with other species. Are they identical or the different? So it is important to understand intermolecular interactions. That means interactions in between two molecules. But uh, I think students who are studying in the third year, they have some uh, last year or sixth sem. Sorry, we have to adapt to the words of semesters right now. Uh, they might have some inf uh, introduction to molecules, but uh, uh, I think other than that. Uh, 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 the rest of the four semesters or five semesters, they don't have any kind of stuff for talking about molecules in their syllabi. So uh, we start with, uh, how do you know that a molecule is interacting with one another? Uh, so let's start with atom-atom interaction. So first, uh, try to understand what is a molecule and then try to understand what is the interaction between one molecule with the other. So if I start with atom-atom interactions, uh, it is just like in nature. It is nothing uh, other than natural one. So uh, we know that when a molecule is formed, uh, the two or two or at least two atoms, or it may be much more. It may be some hundreds and hundreds of atoms can can come together. Hello. How is it? Oh, oh. The, can you observe the, see this? 
now you can see this uh, can you see this slide number 1 to 3 i have to check uh, 1 to 3 this is number 3 this is written intermolecular interactions then how do you know that a molecule is interacting with another and then let's start from atom atom interactions is it visible right now the screen shows the people are holding hands together oh oh i don't know why uh, is it the showing i am going to slideshow but this is like this right now but why uh yes i am i am in the slideshow button yes now it's okay okay so now let's okay. start from atom atom let's start from atom atom interaction uh, uh, so two atoms interacting form molecules it may be much larger but this is exactly the same as in nature. <clears throat> you might ask me, how is it that how nature uh, and atom atom interaction to form molecules is something pretty common? If you look at this picture, sorry, if you look at this picture, this is at the pretty bottom one, uh, you can see uh, that there are a lot of friends holding their hands. Now, when they are as a group, when you, the students, I'm talking about, or even we in our uh, college days, when you move out as a group, then it is the behavior of the group is important where individual ones has no identity. Exactly same in, in case of molecules, when a large number of atoms comes together, what a form, a kind of ensemble of this large number of atoms and holding their hands, just like holding their hands of friends, then atoms also hold their hands. They have a different name of their hands. I will come to that. And they form an entity which is completely different from an individual one. And that entity is called a molecule. And so the formation of molecules, just as a group of friends, needs one's outstretched hand to hold another's hand. Exactly same in case of molecule. One atom has to stretch their hands to hold on to the other. And that hand or the holding of this two hands is called a bond. So when a molecule is formed, we actually call, we actually say that a bond is formed. Uh, so now the important question is, how do you know a molecule is formed and how strong is the bond? Exactly the same in the nature, all friends, friendship doesn't last for a long, some, sometimes someone stays for all of your life and someone just out of sight, out of mind. Exactly the same in case of molecules. Some of the molecules are formed and forms a very strong bond, which is very hard to separate them. And someone is so weak that they, are, they, they actually just separate out even at room temperature. So how do you know that a molecule is formed and how strong is the bond? You have to apply energy and watch, just like wait for the time so that some of so the other part of your friendship whether he thinks of you or she thinks of you or not, and you watch, and with time you find that what, what kind of friendships retain for the rest of your life and some others actually fizzle out. So take a close look. <clears throat> so if I give an energy, am I, am I, is my transparency visible? Take a close look. Oh, oh that's a horrible stuff. Because I have a lot of uh, motion pictures. How can I, uh, how can I do it? I don't know. Huh? Sorry? Yes. Oh, it not, will not work? Hello? Oh, so I am in a fix. Anyway, uh, if you take a close look, then uh, uh, I have a couple of motions uh, to show that how I know that 
the molecule is formed and the number of atoms in the molecule, uh, the constituent number of atoms in the molecule, how do you know? Because I can show a number of figures, some number of movies or some kind of stuff. But in terms of, uh, in terms of experiments or in terms of understanding, you have to know this. So that's for which you know that whenever you have two friends, say for example, I start with only two friends. If you have two friends and they, you are holding your hands, the restriction of each of you is limited. You cannot move on your own. Exactly the same in case of atoms. When you have two atoms connected to a bond in between, which bond is shown by a kind of straight line, then the individual atoms, which were earlier, can freely move. Now they are restricted in their movement and they can move in a particular way. I hope in your uh, undergraduate courses, you will learn uh, that this motion of this kind of coupled systems actually follows a specific rule and specific method. And this is in your classical mechanics class, which is called uh, the motion of system of particles. As also, you will learn this in your degrees of freedom part. That means the in the number of independent ways a, a system can move. And number of independent ways actually depend on the number of constituent particles. And that is called actually normal modes of motions in case of molecules. So when you have diatomic molecules, that means two atoms, you have certain type of uh, movements. When you have three atoms, you have certain type of movements. I can, two atoms have only one type. Three atoms have uh, uh, this kind of, but I cannot sh show you the um, movie. Uh, actually, uh, when I'm moving this, can, can you observe this? Can you see this? When I'm moving this, uh, Somna and Chirantan, please confirm. When I'm moving yes. this, is it visible? It is visible. Sir. Okay. Okay. So when you have three atoms, you have specific way of movement, but unfortunately, I cannot show you the way of movements because movie is not working. Uh, but the number is, is here is restricted. Uh, it, it is not any kind of way one can move. And it's also, it's also happened in solids. Uh, it is not that I am showing only uh, two atoms or uh, a molecule having two or three atoms. Uh, if you have a solid, you will also have certain number of movements. Unfortunately, I cannot show you that movement right now. This is the solid that you can see here. And, uh, oh, sorry, so many movie clips. Uh, and solid movements are much more restricted. Sorry. Solid movements are much more restricted because uh, the solids have a large number of atoms close by. These are connected. So number of mm, uh, atoms in the solid are much uh, larger and they are connected by stronger forces. So their movements are uh, really different from that one, uh, from that of the two atoms or three atom molecules. Uh, as also, there is another movie you can observe uh, later on in, uh, in the paper of Diebold. This is the famous paper where they have shown this is the Parvotskite structure that I'm showing right now in the one. Uh, this is the Parvotskite structure. And on over that, you have a water molecule. And in this one, they have done uh, different kinds of microscopies and different kinds of photo electron spectroscopy to observe the motion of this water, sorry, of this water molecule over this solid surface. This is a very funny and a very interesting one. This is observed first time in 2018. It's uh, also the important stuff is when you have connecting a water molecule with a solid one, you find that the water molecule behaves very differently from the solid materials. Interestingly, in this solid material, these red ones are oxygen atoms. And here water, you have also oxygen atoms. But the behavior is very, very different. So, so it raises the question that the interaction of a water with the other ones is how much different. In this aspect, one thing I have to tell that whenever you see this kind of molecules, this is carbon dioxide, but this is oxygen, this is oxygen, this is carbon, you have in between bonds. I think you, you learned this even for your school's text in your chemistry classes. These are called bonds and these are called covalent bonds. 
Now, in, when water is connected, this is not connected to a covalent bond. And this is called non-covalent bonds. So uh, I can delete this. I can delete this. And this non -co this is this bonding is a very weak one compared to the covalent one. And this is called non-covalent bonding. Now the question is whether atoms can come close together or molecules come close together to form a structure, a assembly where they are not connected by whether when they are not connected only by covalent bonding, if whether there is anything other than covalent bonding which takes part in between atoms to form a molecule or molecular assembly, that kind of assembly is called named cluster. So this is a cluster of water and look at the, it, this is also a movie but unfortunately the same stuff is going on. I cannot show you the movie that how this cluster is moving um, uh, when you give some external feel to it. And this is another figure. This is also a movie. Uh, this is the one where you can, you, you might have, you can observe this uh, green dot is a foreign substance in the form of a drug. And now when, you, when we swallow it, the, how does the water molecules engulf this one and how the, apart from the covalent one, the, the dotted one, these are non-covalent one and these are covalent bonds showing there. So how these are transforming or how these are changing as it passes through this water substance or you can, uh, you can also see it in the other way when you put a um, uh, substance in within the water how does this covalent and non-covalent bondings are changing you can uh, you, you can really observe it nowadays uh, i go to the next one uh, this is also unfortunately i cannot show you so uh, uh, so what are the different kinds of non-covalent interactions? So there are different kinds of non-covalent interactions. This is one uh, that you can see here. This is in between neon uh, atoms and neon atoms can attach to form a molecular assembly. And this, this rare gas ones uh, actually forms a molecular assembly or interact or can form an attractive interaction through a specific kind of interaction, which is called Van der Waals interaction. I think you, you have studied this even in class uh, 12 or 11 when you are studying ideal and real gases. Uh, but most important thing is Van der Waals interactions actually present in all substances. Uh, this is weak, but this is kind of omnipresent because this is this arises from a, uh, from a, a phenomena which is called fluctuating dipoles ones. Unfortunately, I cannot show you, but this is also a movie where you can see when these are coming close together, there is a formation of dipoles, instantaneous dipoles, and you know that when two dipoles are there, their interaction produces an attractive energy, and that very small attractive energy, varying with distance to the power six, actually, uh, and three six, or Leonard Jones kinds of potential, uh, kind of stuff. If you have studied in solid state physics, you, you also learn that uh, that potential part, uh, the, the very weak potential part, uh, the short range interaction actually forms this Van der Waals bond. Then you have ionic bonds with, when there is a physical transfer of electron from one system to the other and the reproduction of ions and their attractive interactions. Then you have metallic bonds where metals, this is the ion force and this violet ones kind of grayish to violet stuff which is moving just like a cloud. These are electron clouds, the attractions between these forms metallic bonds. And the last one of this is called hydrogen bonds. Uh, in, in this hydrogen bonds, which is, what is interesting is, you have, we have shown here two water um, molecules how they are connected and or uh, the other way down, why water forms these kinds of assembly in liquid state and uh, in the solid state ice uh, stuff. Here you find that uh, you have, uh, this red one is the oxygen and this blue ones are the hydrogens at this end. And now you have two things that is shooting out of this, just kind of, just kind of uh, stuff that is coming out of the oxygen atoms. These are called lone pairs. These are extremely important. Uh, you have to know that what is a bond. 
bond the, the bond is a region where you have high electron density in between two atoms so in where, when you have a bond that means this is hydrogen and this is oxygen in between this region this region or this region you have a high density of electrons this electrons actually glues this nucleus and this nucleus oxygen nucleus and hydrogen nucleus to form a bond in between them and now the question is this this bonding strength of the bonding and kind of in the nature of the bonding also depends on the participating atoms this means here oxygen and here hydrogen now if the participating atoms has more number of electrons that can be shared here those electrons will orient themselves or show themselves in this way this electrons here this the extra electrons that is here they are paired electrons paired means this electrons one of the electrons has been plus half or up or another is down these electrons will be under the force field of only one nucleus remember electrons in this region are under the force field of two nuclei one is oxygen another is hydrogen here it is under the force field of only one nucleus that is oxygen so that's for which this is called lone pair because it doesn't have another it doesn't find another friend or another atom to hold it so this is called lone pair these are extremely important in case of this water mixing with another water or another substance and this bond is called hydrogen bond uh, and now the, the important question is how, what kind of experiments you have to do to look at this uh, one of the ex so if you want to do experiments as i have told that uh, whenever you have we form a molecules the way the atoms can move are called normal modes of motion so the characteristics of the signatures of the individual molecules actually determined by their signatures of their movements of signature of their motions now motions are two kinds for a molecule the one is vibrational and another is rotational so you have to observe the different kinds of vibrational rotational motions of molecule to understand the nature of its motions as also when it bonds with other molecules the nature of the changes in that kinds of motions this vibrational motions really occur in the in uh, ir frequency range or infrared frequency range of the electromagnetic wave spectrum rotational ones in the microwave part so for a covalently bonded system it is pretty easy to do ftir and raman experiments one thing you have to uh, you, you, i think uh, students should know that if raman is not there one will not uh, uh, one will not observe the uh, this vibrational motions of this motions of the diatomic molecules raman is the first person who actually uh, shows to the universe shows to the world that the diatomic molecules can be experimentally can be their vibrational frequencies uh, homonuclear diatomic molecules their vibrational frequencies can really be observed experimentally uh, so uh, in that way ftir and raman is pretty important uh, but for the non covalently bonded ones this are not sufficient because the strength of the non covalent bonding whatever you can call van der waals or hydrogen bonds or other stuff and the directionality of the interactions actually makes them pretty complex and these two earlier uh, the referred uh, spectroscopic methods uh, may not be sufficient to understand them oh there is another issue here uh, hydrogen bonding and water now when you have water water molecules forms a variety of structures uh, if you look at this figure if you look at this figure you can see there is a you have two water three water molecules four five six seven uh, you might ask them uh, you might ask me that uh, what hell with this kind of structures are all these structures observed um, Uh, experimentally or is it important for our daily life or some kind of stuff or is it some only thing for research actually uh, this different kinds of water structures when you have only one or two water molecules or three four or five or six uh, you might have if there is only water you might have specific kinds of uh, selectivity or that means say for example if you have four water molecules then four water molecules prefer this kind five water molecules prefer this kind but the issue is when you have when you have waters in different kinds of environments i will come to that a little later 
which is also observed nat in nature in different environments. In that case, is this arrangement of waters and the number of water molecules that can be arranged that also changes. And in that way, these different kinds of structures become important. It might not be so important at room temperature water liquids. Another is variation that arises is from the number and orientation of the bonds. Uh, this is important. And now this external parameter, this is the very important stuff. This graph is very important. If you look at this graph, if you look at this graph, I'm, I don't know how far visible it is. In the below, it is the, because I have to arrange so many uh, plots. Um, in the below, you have temperature, and in the uh, y-axis, you can see the number of hydrogen bonds around each water molecule. That means if there is one hydrogen bond, you have two water molecules, you have two hydrogen bonds, you have three water molecules, you have three hydrogen bonds, you have four water molecules. And now, if you have, if you change your temperature, you can find that this is temperature in K, in Kelvin, so room temperature, uh, which is roughly 300 degree Kelvin or 27 degree centigrade, you will find that you have this number of water molecules, this number of hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds number is a kind of less than four. Uh, it's a dynamic process because these are these are changing with temperature. These are these are uh, varying. So bonds are breaking and bonds are growing. Uh, bonds are developing. But as you go on reducing the temperatures, look at the uh, say, for example, at zero degree Kelvin, zero degree centigrade, sorry, at zero degree centigrade, uh, that means when ice is formed, the number of water molecules, number of hydrogen bonds changes, and number of water molecules needed to form a structure of ice is different from the water that we really uh, observe, uh, that you really drink um, uh, daily. And as we go on increasing the temperature, you will find that the number of water, uh, number of hydrogen bonds and the assembly of water molecules changes. And you can find that uh, even if you go to 650 degree Kelvin, that means it is not, uh, not so low temperature. That means it is uh, roughly about 400 degree centigrade, nearly about that. Even at 400 degrees centigrade, water, whenever the pins, you, you, are, you are moving above the, uh, you are moving much, much above the water the vapor uh, temperature. That means uh, much above the um, boiling point. So even at 400 degrees centigrade, what we call in the vapor state, in the vapor state, you will also have uh, not, uh, all the water molecules are not separated out and they actually have at least one bond with them. So at least two water molecules are there. And this is the hydrogen, uh, this is, sorry, this is the ice structure, which uh, in the earlier figure I have shown that uh, uh, you have four uh, water, four hydrogen bonds, and their structure is looks like this. This is kind of, this is called, uh, in terms of chemical uh, intuition, this is called a tetrahedral structure. This ice structure is called I1H. I will come to that a little later. Uh, now, signatures of water. So if you have uh, water molecules, uh, a large number of water molecules, uh, you have, when you have a number of water molecules increases, you have this kind of spectrum. And this spectrum, and if you have a single water molecule, you have this kind of water spectrum. This is called infrared um, spectrum that I, that, I, that I told you a little bit earlier. And their motions this is very becoming very cumbersome here with the way things are going on. Uh, these are the ways. Uh, fortunately, I cannot show you the movement of, because movie is not working. Uh, uh, there are three kinds of motions of water molecules. Uh, and these three kinds of motions can be very easily identified by their FTIR spectra. And these are the actually the signatures of water molecules. And these frequencies, these characteristic frequencies, uh, in an FTIR spectrometer also identifies the presence of any water vapor there also, or is, even as a contaminant. Now, if we have a large number of water molecules interacting with the one another, this spectra will go on broadening, and this shows you that it is not a, it, this is not a spectrum of a uh, isolated water species or two or three water species. It's a large number of water molecules interacting with one another, and in that case, you will find this kind of spectrum.
And now, if you have variety of states, the signatures, look at how the signatures changes. So, if you have water vapor at 25 degrees centigrade, you have this kind of, um, uh, if you have water vapor, you have this kind of uh, temperature. You have liquid at 25 degrees centigrade is like this. And if you have ice, uh, you have this kind of uh, spectrum. Uh, I'm not going into the details of the spectrum. This the change in spectrum, that's to the students particularly, this change in spectrum actually identifies that what kind of water you are using here. Oh, another. So, uh, Sir, oh. uh, are you presenting from your laptop? Yes. I am presenting okay. from my laptop. Okay. Uh, present, I am presenting from my laptop. Yes, yes, of course I am showing and this is also moving. Yeah, but so here the problem is, problem is I cannot go to the slideshow presentation. Okay, slide That's show the problem. Laptop. I went there, but it is not observing. You, uh, it's not showing there. I can see the side slide show, but you are not observing that. That's the problem, and that makes my life very dangerous yes. right now. Yes, that, that I understand. Uh, now, anyway, I am continuing. Uh, this is the solar spectrum. So, solar spectrum. Uh, uh, in this solar spectrum, uh, uh, you can see that if you. Uh, just uh, observe the whole spectrum of uh, sunlight that is coming from the sunlight and if you use a uh, spectrometer there of course when you are taking the spectrum of outside atmosphere you have to go outside this uh, above this atmosphere to observe the spectrum uh, the experiments that the students are doing in their MSc classes the experiments here are not at all different because you have a source and then you have a uh, dispersing device and then you have some device which can record, we can separate out and record the individual wavelengths. And, and so if you record this spectrum, just you have done as you have done in your new lambda experiments, but here this spectrum is a continuous one. If you have observed this uh, spectrum, the uh, solar spectrum looks like this, the red one here. And if you fit it with um, about uh, 500, 500 degrees centigrade, uh, 5,500 degrees centigrade, black body radiation, it almost fits like to that. Uh, and so you can see that this continuous spectrum, uh, we can correlate with the black body radiation uh, from sunlight. But now, if you observe this spectrum and analyze this spectrum at sea level, which is given in the blue one, you will find some spikes. The spikes are extremely important. You will find spikes here. One of the important stuff is, uh, the spike for the absorption of O3 is much, much less reduced from upper atmosphere to the sea level, which is a great thing. And that's for which the ozone holes in the upper atmospheres uh, creates a lot of trouble. So uh, that's a good thing at the sea level when you measure the O3 level. But this water levels, you will find that this stuff, which is shown here as a small box, which is the only visible part that we observe in your naked eye, you have some absorptions of water in the red region. So now there are some absorptions. I'm not saying all absorptions of water. Some absorptions of water are in the red region. And interestingly, these water absorptions in, in, in that situations where waters are, are in a very pressurized state or in a very condensed state. Uh, you know that when, uh, and also in the cold atmosphere, uh, that means a sub zero uh, temperature. So now, <clears throat> if you have a situation where your temperature is much below zero degree centigrade, that means, of course, it should have an ice and it is highly pressurized. Then that ice will absorb your red part of the spectrum, yellow part of the spectrum. And that ice will look like a, a kind of the portion, the, the, the color of the ice will be like that one, which it cannot absorb. And that is the blue one. And now you can see, now you can see this is the Kumhu icefall of the Mount Everest. If someone has interest in trekking, and if you look at the um, some uh, high altitude trekking, you can find that 
uh, these glaciers have blue eyes. And uh, sometimes you also note in the newspapers that people talk about the melting of blue ice. Blue ice is an extremely important thing. Blue ice is the one which had formed much, much earlier, uh, maybe some thousands of years earlier after the formation of these glaciers. And these are in the highly uh, high pressure region where within the ice, uh, uh, I think you know, or you, you can just look at uh, some old book stuff to find that uh, ice has some flaky structures. So that means within the ice, there are some porous regions. So if you give it pressure, these porous regions, the water in between, the air in between will come out and the ice, the ice structure will be much different from the one that I have shown a little uh, while earlier. And that ice will look like the blue one. And this blue ice is extremely important. Another uh, thing is from the trekking of one of the mountaineer to the going to the Everest and you can see the blue ice here. So uh, this structure of ice is also important if you want to look it in a greater detail. Uh, I think I cannot, this is the ice structure. This is look at the ice crystal structure. This is the um, uh, lattice structure of the ice or the crystalline structure of ice. Uh, you must have to know that there is also, uh, in, apart from crystalline, there are some amorphous ices also and that are observed in the uh, extraterrestrial environment. The, if you look at the um, unit cell, it will look like an hexagonal uh, type of structure for the ice. And next I go to uh, when water is acting as a host, whatever I'm telling till now is everything about interaction of, of water with water molecules. Now, when water acts as a host, so it takes some gas, then hydrogen bonding uh, plays a key role. And, and this interaction of host and guest is important to understand the protein folding, which is which I hope you all know how important it is, functionality of drugs, which is, uh, which is the one uh, area we are working. And it's also inter important in the atmospheric sciences. So understanding the interaction of water with the other molecules is important. And the experiments are also very challenging. Uh, as time is sitting almost 12.45, I uh, might not have to cover all or people might be, uh, students might be very uh, restless, waiting for, continuing for one and uh, uh, nearly two hours. Uh, uh, I cannot show you, unfortunately, what is in, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, if you uh, go to uh, do the experiments, uh, you have to uh, do experiments in uh, such a condition where, uh, where you have to isolate the individual molecules and then start interacting of water with that isolated species. And this kind of experiments are done, uh, which is called molecular beam experiments. And uh, uh, molecular beam experiments are uh, important uh, to understand uh, the signatures of individual molecules in absolute isolation. Uh, after, so if you look at the, if you look at the spectrum of the guest and host, remember host is water and guest is the other molecule. You can see that, the, I'm not going into the details with the time constraint, you can see that the, uh, the spectrum is changing uh, as you change the interaction between the guest and host, it, it, it might, it might be the, you can, you are changing the distance of the host to the guest, you are changing the number of host and guest molecules and this change in the spectrum or change in the characteristics of the spectrum, change in the signatures of the, of the spectral lines is important. But one question is, from experiments, you will only look at how it changes, but how far you have to go, uh, how far you have to conclude from the spectrum, for that you need computations. And if you want to do computations, you have to have a good understanding of mechanics and mathematical physics. Nowadays, a lot of custom-made softwares are available, but the problem is 
so softwares you if you don't go inside the softwares or if you don't learn coding how to do coding you will not learn what is going on inside your system so with learning of a little bit of computation and mechanics and a kind of mathematical physics understanding uh, i think you will learn to do computations uh, and from that one you can try to understand what is the structures and what is the interactions in between the guest and host so this subject you need both experiments as also uh, theoretical understanding now my question is what will be your activity in during this pandemic or during this time i think if you have confusions go back to your school text and brush up i think you have no uh, uh, issue of examinations if and if you have issue of examinations that will be uh, not of very uh, large um, not not a very big one uh, uh, because you don't have to go to the examination halls to uh, sit for the conventional exams uh, i think uh, you will always ask the questions whenever you are studying something that how this study will help me afterwards you keep asking within yourself and also note down your questions and ask to your teachers later uh, i think don't waste this golden time for recapitulation this is the ideal time for recapitulation the chemistry mathematics and other subjects are very important i hope you understand from my deliberations that how important such chemistry and mathematics are uh, and and also a pretty important research is not based on any subject like physics chemistry mathematics or biology these are interlinked and everything is uh, interdisciplinary uh, i try to give an idea of bonding of water with its clusters unfortunately technical issues i didn't have envisaged that this kind of issues will come up during my talk so i might have i should have thought it i'm extremely sorry uh, that uh, it becomes pretty bad in between due to uh, the non functioning of movies but i tried to give you some idea of uh, what is the importance of this this one uh, and uh, 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 if you have any questions at any time you can ask me uh, through email or whatsapp and your um, teachers have uh, my email addresses so these are the different partitions for some mutual video of indian association for the cultivation of science from where i did my phd and this uh, famous professors graham fleming and stopper and ralph kaiser of course i acknowledge hogli women's college for allowing me this in a very shabby way unfortunately the university of bordeaux and dst and thank you for your patience nikas so what you show me thank you uh, dr abhir chakraborty for your wonderful talk uh, not really not really the situation is becomes very more in between <laughs> okay okay there were some technical uh, problems some glitches but overall it was uh, good to uh, listen to your talk thank you uh, so the session is open for some questions sir yeah please go ahead if someone yes yeah, someone uh, uh, so there are some questions uh, rt okay uh i cannot see his or her full name uh, he has asked what is the size of water cluster is it within uh, nano scale okay uh, uh, unfortunately i cannot i didn't i i, I couldn't able to show you uh, if you have it depends on how many waters there if you have two water molecules only uh, then if you have two water molecules forms what is called a dimer then the distance between the two water molecules or the hydrogen bond length distance is 1.88 angstrom so when you increase this distance to say for example three water molecules this changes if you look at the structure of ice so and i'm going to the extreme one if you go to the solid state structure in the ice the distance is 2.87 angstrom so it depends on how many uh, water molecules are there or how many polymers in kinds of in, in the way, words of polymerization how many polymers are there so in that way this changes 
But in terms of nano structures, ones the question. This is very important. The one uh, slide I have shown that uh, the movement of water molecule uh, over the perovskite structure. In that one, this is a nanomaterial one. And unfortunately, I couldn't show you the complete movie. Uh, so if uh, I, I, I think I, uh, Shobhnath and Chirantan, I send you the uh, complete uh, presentation. So you can uh, share it with the students whom they can go back to your computer and look at the movies. And they have their distances marked there. So they can watch the distances, how they are changing. OK, sir. Any other we questions? Say other to yeah, um, I have um, one or two questions. Surely, surely. Uh, yeah. Uh, one is, uh, what is the current textbook explanation of anomalous expansion of water? I mean, at 4 degrees centigrade, why the density is highest? And uh, there are, that, there are, uh, yeah. And is it only water or any other? I mean, why HCl the, or or any other liquid? They don't have this an anomalous structure. I mean, why water is so special? Yes, the the main reason is the hydrogen bonding. <clears throat> In HCl, when you look at the HCl, the hydrogen bonding that means this is the difference in electronegativity between chlorine and hydrogen and difference in electronegativity with oxygen and hydrogen. In HCl, you have only, it is HCl is a diatomic molecule. So HCl can form only one hydrogen bond. That means chlorine can form a hydrogen bond with the other. But when you think of water, look at that way, oxygen has lone pairs that can form two hydrogen bonds. Oxygen molecule, oxygen, sorry, oxygen atom has two lone pairs in the water molecule. So it forms, it can have, it has two hands. So with two hands, the structure is much more open. That means in between, they have much more pores or that much more open space. That's for which the density is less there in case of water. Okay. Compared to HCl, of course. Compared to HCl. And fourth degree is that uh, point where the, it is more and more. Uh, four, four degree is a very, four degree is a very important stuff. Uh, uh, this is important come, comes from the, if you look at the phase transitions of water. And if you look at the dynamics of how water clusters changes their structures, because even if you consider ice, you have, or if you consider the crystal structure of water, the, you have 14 different types of crystal structures solid structures, I'm, I'm making a wrong statement, 14 different kinds of arrangements in solid state of water. That means sure. everyone is not crystalline. Someone is amorphous also. So eyes, whatever you see in the eyes, these have a kind of uh, equilibrium in between a kind, different kinds of structures as also when you take out ice from your freezer, you will observe that you have different types of ices. One ice, you have perfectly transparent, and in some ices, they have some turbid structures or opaque. Even when you allow the ice to melt, you see the changes of the turbidity from opaqueness to transparent ones, as also you will find some bubbles inside the ices. This all things actually indicate the different kinds of phenomena going on inside the crystal structure of ice. Okay. Any other question? No. Uh, I had lots of questions, but maybe I will email you. Yes, yeah, surely. Surely you can. Okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. I will learn from you, from the questions. Okay, let us uh, thank the speaker again, if there is no more question. And no, I cannot see any more questions. And I will uh, share your talk file with the students. Okay. PPT file. Yes. Uh, over to Purnagor uh, Shubhavu. Thank you, Shamnath, and thank you, Dr. Chakraborty, for your lucid explanation over 
uh, your topic, what you're learning. And uh, I must mention uh, separately your modesty. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, hope uh, we'll uh, uh, join again in some other time in some other platform uh, uh, with some uh, lucid discussion with you and with the, all the participants. Now with the, this uh, talk of uh, Dr. Chakraborty where came to the end of our first technical session and our second technical session will start right at uh, 6 p.m. where Dr. Chakraborty Kundu will present her talk. Until then, goodbye, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you all.